Tonight we're going to talk about this thermal and cross-country course of mine. Uh, there's the web address there at the bottom, which you've probably already found. I'll start with the whole, what is the purpose of the course? And it is simply to help pilots of all types of gliders, paragliders, hang gliders, sailplanes, develop thermaling and cross-country flying skills more quickly than through conventional means alone. That's it. That's, that's it in a nutshell. Tonight we'll cover a number of topics. We will start with glider and soaring history. We'll talk a little bit about how glider pilot training is done and maybe some ideas on how to do it better. We'll discuss some general learning concepts that apply to all sorts of things, but we'll of course apply them to our flying. We'll talk about some of the mental side of soaring. We'll look at some examples of simulation-based training, uh, not just in flying, and discuss the benefits of simulation-based training. And then we'll get into a detailed overview of this particular course, how it works, some of its content. So we'll dive right into the first section, a, a brief history of soaring. I'm no history buff, but I'll, I'll give you a few pieces of history. Maybe there will at least be one you didn't know already. I think the key point of this section is that thermaling is a relatively new thing. You've probably heard of Otto Lilienthal. He was a German who did some very early gliding. We can't call it soaring. Uh, he was just basically working on the design of an aircraft that could glide and just take off and land under human power only. He was the first, and he did this uh, in this period of 1891 to 1896, so during that five or six year period, he did this. He was the first to make repeated, controlled, untethered glides. He made about 2,000 of these before Unfortunately, he died in a crash in, in one of them. Uh, I understand it was a pitch stability issue, and that was something that, that was a problem that didn't get solved for a long time, uh, that a glider could go into a dive from which it was impossible to recover. So his first glide was only around 126 years ago. Uh, I, I don't know if there's anyone that age alive today but close so if, if not then it wasn't long ago that someone was alive uh, who was alive when he made his first of these glides I'm an American so I have to discuss uh, Orville and Wilbur Wright a little bit of course and what you see pictured here is what they called their 1902 glider you know, a clever name from a couple of engineers or technical guys. And it was simply the point w where they decided, okay, yes, we have a controllable design here. We have a fixed axis, a fixed wing, three axis control aircraft that we can control. And I like to tease and say they got distracted with engines and, and lost their lost their direction. You know, they were on the right path to start with with gliders and they, they veered off to engines, but that's not really the way it happened. Uh, as I understand, they intended to put an engine on it from the start. They just took a phased approach. Let's build a frame, an aircraft that we can control, and then put an engine on it. So they, they did what they planned. Here are a few other interesting dates in glider and soaring history. In 1911, Orville Wright set a world glider duration record of just under 10 minutes. So look how far we've come in just over a century. In 1920, uh, the Germans uh, really got active with glider design, largely because they were banned 
from powered aircraft by the World War I Treaty of Versailles. And to this day, most people would agree that Germans make the best sailplanes. In 1928, this was the first I could find in, in my research of when did someone first climb in a thermal. It appears to be 1928, a guy named Robert Kronfeld from Austria. He demonstrated that a glider could gain altitude in a thermal. So, if we call this the first thermaling, that was only about 89 years ago. So there are definitely people alive today who were alive before a human had ever climbed in a thermal. And again, a little bit more uh, American pride. In 1956, Dr. Paul McCready was the first American to win a World Soaring Championship. Uh, odds are you're familiar with that name already. If not, you will be soon enough. Here's a bit of hang gliding history since most of my flying has been in hang gliders. In 1948, a NASA engineer named Francis Regalo invented a flexible wing that, again, with clever naming, naming from engineers, the Regalo wing, uh, which that later evolved into the modern hang glider. Uh, around 1961 or 62 is the first documented foot launch of a hang glider based on Francis Regalo's design. About 10 years later, best I could tell, and I have some question marks here because I'm not 100% sure of these facts, but the best I can tell, it was somewhere around here that someone first foot launched one of these Regalo wing hang gliders not using skis. And that around the same time was the first time someone thermaled one of these. And somewhere around 1981, was the first time that a U.S. national hang gliding contest included cross-country flying. And, and that says a couple of things. It says that glider design had advanced enough that flying cross-country was possible. Because you, do, you need a certain amount of glide ratio for it to even be really possible to do uh, consistently enough to make a contest of it anyway. And it also suggests that there was enough collective experience with thermaling because it's, it's difficult to do much cross-country flying without thermaling. So it suggests that hang glider pilots sort of had a, a moderate handle on thermaling. That's only 1981, so that's not even 40 years ago, 30, 36 years ago. If you take the Earth to be 6,000 years old, as, as some do, then this red section over here is about how long man has been thermaling, dating back to Kronfeld. If you, uh, if you put it on the scale of how long archaeologists typically say modern humans have existed, 200,000 years, then, then it's just this tiny little sliver over here on the right. And unless you're looking at this on a, you know, a 1080 HD resolution screen, it probably looks wider than it should be. And if you want to put it in the scale of what most scientists say is the age of the Earth, four and a half billion years, then for this red sliver to be the width of a human hair, you'd need a screen about five miles wide. So the point of all this silliness is that thermaling is a fairly new thing. So I think I encourage you to consider yourself an explorer and a pioneer. Don't assume that everything about thermaling has been learned because it hasn't. So explore, pioneer, and maybe most importantly for the future of our sports, pass what you learn on. A lot of, a lot of new discoveries get rediscovered because they weren't communicated well into the future. Uh, another, another reason that I encourage you along these lines is there aren't that many 
soaring pilots. So I, I did a little research to try to compare to other things. About one in ten people play golf. About one in ten people fish. About one in fifteen are archers, which I, I haven't I didn't see this number back before the Hunger Games books and movies came out, but I, I suspect that it increased. Uh, how many people are archers? One in 23 people are colorblind. One in 100 are scuba divers. One in 900 live births are triplets. One in 7,000 people die in a car accident. And I found this. I thought it was a f uh, kind of a funny stat. But someone calculated, predicted, that there's a 1 in 13,000 chance you will die in an asteroid apocalypse. <laughs> and there's a 1 in 15,000 chance that any random person you walk up to is a glider pilot. I grew up in a town of about only 5,000 people. So that means in three towns that size, that size, on average there would be one glider pilot between those three towns. So obviously soaring is a very small market sport. And it's of little or no military value. I've, I've heard of projects, and, and I think I just heard of one in the last week or two, uh, where they're trying to use soaring techniques to extend the durations of UAVs. Uh, but I, I don't think they've really come up with a practical way to do that. But it's, it's a currently, I think it's yet to prove itself of virtually any military value or commercial value. So if those of us who do it recreationally don't explore and learn and document what we learn, then no one else is going to. So let's talk now a bit about how glider pilot training is done with the thought in the back of our minds, can we do it better? How can we do better? What can we improve? I noticed as I was learning to fly and eventually confirmed it through a lot of other people I came in contact with that there is essentially, there's a pretty good void, a vacuum in thermaling and cross-country training. I, I had this suspicion because at least in my experience there was and I wondered if it was a wider issue or just a very local issue. So in the winter of 2011-2012, I put out a, a semi-local survey. So it reached out maybe 100 miles from me and asked some questions. And one of the interesting things I found from it was that around half of intermediate rated hang glider and paraglider pilots, because they were all I questioned with this survey, reported that they lose half or more of the thermals they find. And I, I put some pretty strong caveats on that question to tell them, don't count a thermal as lost if you think it was just too narrow, too snaky, it had died, or it was just in some way too difficult for an average pilot to stay in. And even though I, I gave it that strong caveat, about half of the intermediate rated pilots said that they lose half or more of their thermals. I think that suggests a problem with our training. Most formal training, flight training, is just to get you to what I call the safe and legal point to where an instructor thinks you can fly safely without hurting yourself, without hurting other people, and to where whatever regulating body, the FAA, for example, uh, would give you a certificate saying that they believe the same, that you're, you're okay to fly, you know the rules, 
Uh, we think you're safe enough. But when it comes to training on how to do what gliders are meant to do, which is stay up for hours at the time with, with no engine and fly long distances, training on that is pretty rare, especially structured, formal training. Pilots tend to rarely fly tandem after they're certified to fly solo. Now, this is uh, more true in hang gliding and paragliding, because in hang gliding and paragliding, you can learn solo. I never flew tandem. I only flew tandem once in a hang glider, and it was years after I had been flying solo. You know, for hours at the time and going cross country, you, you can learn all this in a hang glider solo and that it's often done that way uh, a lot of hang glider and paraglider pilots for that reason will never fly tandem so they never have the advantage of a more experienced knowledgeable pilot in the glider with them uh, sailplane pilots because training is always done tandem they get more of this uh, interaction with an experienced pilot in the glider with them and, and that's helpful so I think maybe this problem is a little worse in the hang gliding and paragliding world, but I still see that in sailplanes, the bullet just before this one is true. Most people would rather go out and fly solo than to fly tandem with someone. And, and there's a lot to be learned by flying tandem. I think that's the ideal way to teach soaring, is get in the glider with someone who's better at it than you are. Pilots who launch exclusively by towing tend to learn to thermal sooner. I, I did most of my hang gliding launching off a mountain. So I, I didn't tow, I ran off the mountain. And, but tow pilots learn to thermal sooner for a couple of reasons. One is it's easier on their wallet if they can stay up. They don't have to pay for multiple tows each day, but also if they land out, they can relaunch more easily. If I launch off the mountain and sink out and land, it's going to be an hour and a half to two hours before I'm ready to take off again because I have to break down my glider, put it on the roof of a vehicle, drive back up the mountain, take it off the roof, set it back up, get everything all ready again, and launch. So that costs a lot of time and energy where a tow pilot can just launch over and over and over and get a lot more practice. But the, the status quo for learning thermaling and cross country seems to be to do it through solo experience. Just go out and fly and you'll learn it is, is what's, that's how it's done mostly. Say, oh, you want to learn to thermal? Just go fly. Try it. When the vario beeps turn, you know, you'll get, that's about it for a lot of thermaling and cross-country training. I like what this, uh, this guy, Immanuel Kant, uh, a German philosopher from two or three hundred years ago, I like what he said on the topic of experience versus theory. And I mention this because of that last point that the status quo seems to be, oh, just go learn it through experience. And he says, experience without theory is blind, but theory without experience is mere intellectual play. So what he says is there's a balance. There's a proper balance. If you want to learn something well, and he wasn't talking about soaring, but he could have been. Uh, if you want to learn something well, you need to Go to class, like what we're doing right now. Uh, read books, read articles, uh, listen to people who know the subject matter. But you also need to experience it. If you do either one without the other, you don't progress very quickly. If you do both, that's when you progress the most quickly. I struggled for 10 years learning to thermal. Uh, I knew it could be done better. 
I read books, I read magazine articles, I asked other pilots for help, and I got very little that was useful. Or I got just a, a scattering of information and I didn't know which was right or which was the most important. And so for 10 years I was frustrated because I knew it could be done better and I just couldn't seem to do it real well. Now if you compared me to other pilots with my same level of experience, I was just as good as any of them. So I didn't stick out like a sore thumb. I just knew somehow that it w could be better. Uh, I guess the somehow is I watched guys who were more experienced do it a lot better and seemingly with relative ease. Yet they weren't able to tell me how they did it in, in any kind of helpful way. So I struggled. It was frustrating. And that story is probably my number one motivation for this whole course is it doesn't have to be that way. I think we lose a lot of pilots who aren't tenacious enough to see through those 10 years and really struggle and search for how to do this. They give up or resign themselves to just not being able to do it well resign themselves to short flights or only being able to stay up on the really good days. And so they miss out on a lot of fun. And it, it's kind of, it's not a very compelling story, uh, testimonial for recruiting. So if we're trying to grow our sport, which I think would help, it, it's helpful if we can tell them that it's, it's relatively easy. To, and you stay up for hours. I mean, it's challenging enough to be fun, but easy enough that anyone can do it. You don't have to spend 10 years to get there. So I hope I can spare a few people a few years of frustration. I would like to see, and, and I put this as a question, but I, I kind of would answer yes. I, I would like to see us standardize on a way to teach thermaling. So at least standardize on a basic thermaling method and maybe institutionalize somehow uh, getting that done. Uh, maybe we, we come up with a, a short how-to brief, just hitting the most uh, important points and in a very simple way that a beginner can apply and make it uh, standard practice to send that to every new member of our governing body. So everyone who joins or maybe send it when they reach some milestone like the hang gliding and paragliding organization has a rating system. So maybe when you get to the rating 2 level uh, you get this little document or a link to a video or something, a magazine, a pamphlet telling you how to thermal. But if you ask you know, five people how to thermal, you might get six different answers. And that, that makes it more difficult for a beginner to sort through. Because if you listen to any one person's entire method of thermaling, you might could work with that. But when you pull a piece from this guy, and a piece from this guy, and a piece from that guy, and they use three different methods, they might not all fit together, and now you have a confused uh, student, if you will. A lot of us sometimes think, well, if I can just get a better better glider, one with a higher glide ratio, some fancier electronics, better equipment, then it'll be easier. I'll, it'll be okay. But if you take a pilot who doesn't know how to stay in a thermal and give him the best glider on the planet, I would bet a lot of money that a pilot who can just thermal like an average pilot so he knows how to stay in a thermal give him a glider with half the performance and he will outperform the guy with the higher performance glider learning knowing how to stay in a thermal knowing how to thermal is more performance enhancing than a pretty significant equipment upgrade and it doesn't cost you as much money either and I, I mentioned this before but if you can't thermal, you can't fly very much cross country. Now you can with ridge lift, and occasionally you might could use uh, 
a wave or some form of convergence to, to, make, to do some meaningful cross country. But generally when you hear people talk about flying cross country, there are thermals involved as a key ingredient of that flight. Because thermals are there, thermals exist everywhere on the planet virtually every day. Some of those other things don't. They're unique, take unique conditions to form. So thermaling is the number one key to flying cross country. I desperately wanted to fly cross country during my first 10 years, and I, I would try. I would occasionally get a lucky climb, climb up high, and just turn around and immediately go downwind. And I, I had a lot of one glide cross country flights, if you can even call them that. Uh, once I learned how to thermal, you know, that light switch moment about 10 years into flying, after I learned a couple of key things about how to stay in a thermal, once I was able to do that, I could fly cross country on any decent day. Thermal after thermal after thermal, and as long as the conditions remained okay, I could stay up and keep going. It was a real game changer. It was the key to flying cross country. So thermaling is very important. It's the key to more altitude, more air time, and distance. And I've just, I find it a whole lot of fun. I mean, being in, a, being able to stay in this invisible column or bubble of rising air and climb with it, that's, after 23 years, it's still fascinating. It, it's still interesting and a whole lot of fun. So on to the next section. Let's look at some general learning concepts. Again, these are not uh, specific to soaring. No, they probably apply to just learning in general. So these are some ideas that you can use to help you learn whatever it is you're trying to learn. In this case, thermaling and cross-country flying. I, I like to think of the human mind and body as something like this bucket. You know, it's open at the top, it, it mostly holds what you put into it, but it has some holes in it, so it, stuff leaks out. So some of us have, you know, bigger buckets. Some of us have fewer holes. Some of us pour the water in faster or slower. But the idea is the faster you pour it in, the higher you can keep the level in the bucket, which is your, your skill, your knowledge. So you keep pouring in practice and knowledge, and you can raise the level in your bucket. At some point, you're going to reach equilibrium, and the rate at which you pour in is equaling the rate at which it spills out, and that's where you will plateau in your skill, more or less. If you then stop practicing or studying, the level will get lower, and so forth. So the pros are uh, probably have a little bit bigger buckets. Maybe Maybe they're blessed with a larger bucket with fewer holes. But they also are pouring it in faster than the average guy. So this helps me, this image helps me to stay motivated, to stay at it, keep studying, repeat the same lessons, think about these things, and of course go out and fly and practice them. Here are a number of other truths in learning that I think can help us. Be deliberate about what it is you want to learn. Uh, if you just go out and fly, for example, if you, just, if you just take the advice of just go fly and you'll learn it, then, and you have no particular lesson in mind, nothing you're really seeking to learn, you're just flying, taking the lessons as they come to you. Well, it's good to be open to that and see a lesson when it comes to you, but I call this accidental learning, and it is slow. Uh, you may make very slow progress on a lot of different fronts, but by the time you have any two lessons on the same topic, you may have forgotten the previous lesson. So be deliberate about what it is you want to learn. And beware. Uh, you, we're probably all old enough to have seen this in just in life in general, but just because someone says something or writes it, even with great authority and conviction, doesn't mean it's true. So be critical and judge for yourself. Uh, likewise, just because something is said without great 
conviction or certainty doesn't mean it's not true so sometimes uh, what is not true is shouted loudly and written in bold font while what is true is whispered and not written anywhere so you can't tell just by the conviction whether something is true the conviction of the writer or speaker and someone who's really good at doing something is often not very good at teaching it I, I think it's unusual to find someone who's really good at both they're two separate disciplines just because something can do s someone can do something well doesn't mean they can teach it well uh, just because someone is good at teaching doesn't mean they can do something well so they're they're independent someone who's really good at doing something pretty often doesn't even know how they do it or at least can't express it in a way that's helpful to someone who doesn't already know how to do it and he may think otherwise because the words he says out loud to teach you how to do it might make perfect sense in his head but they don't in yours and he's maybe not accustomed to the discipline of teaching enough to even ask you does that make sense to you does that help and to try to say it another way you'll just say it and move on thinking he has enlightened you and you know it's no fault of his it's just they're two separate disciplines doing something and teaching something I know how to tie my shoes but I would have a hard time right now writing down or telling you in words how I tie my shoes uh, even a master teacher occasionally thinks or says something wrong and even a doofus like me so this is good for me occasionally thinks or says something right uh, more is learned while listening than while talking if you're if you're around someone that you think has some good knowledge that you, you want then the best thing you can do is steer him with questions and sit back and listen and if you don't understand something of course speak up let him know you don't understand try to ask a specific question and 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 he'll hopefully help you but too often and I'm talking to myself myself with everything tonight as much as I am talking to anyone else it's easy to get you know get excitable and uh, start running off at the mouth and not listening and I walk away from that thinking, well, I just squandered an opportunity to learn because I couldn't shut up. If you hear a new idea, put it to the test. Uh, it's often easy to dismiss an idea if it sounds crazy. But give it a shot. Don't just dismiss it. But likewise, don't just accept it. You know, don't just assume that because someone says something, it's right and it's going to work so don't don't just accept it don't just dismiss it test it if you haven't tested it before test it let the test tell you whether it's a good idea and if something doesn't make sense to you ask ask for some clarification or say you know explain the trouble you're having with it if the person speaking is really interested in you learning something they won't be insulted or offended by this or or, or feel uh, defensive about it at all you know be polite about it don't put them on the defensive but they should be uh, interested in trying to say it another way or maybe maybe they said something they didn't mean to say uh, maybe they just didn't say it clearly so ask if it doesn't make sense it's it's too easy to just say ah well what he just said doesn't make any sense I know it's wrong therefore I'm gonna totally tune out the rest of this conversation and often enough we humans make mistakes and we just say things wrong we might even think we said up when we said down so let us know and hopefully we can straighten it out and move forward and learn something but flip side is just because something does make sense doesn't mean it's true 
for there were plenty of things in history that smart people thought made sense, like a flat earth or the sun orbiting the earth. So very smart people have thought some things that weren't true and have totally believed them. And I'm convinced that's, that's just part of the human condition. And I'm sure there are people today who totally believe some things that are not true. I probably am one of them. So we need to be on guard for this. Just because it seems to make sense doesn't mean it's true. I think the question is your best tool if you're looking to learn something. Ask questions. And if there's one question that uh, beats all the others, in my opinion, it's the question, why? Why is that so? But don't be surprised when you find that over in the course of answering a question, you will usually find at least one more new question. So your, your total count of unanswered questions will probably go up the, the more questions you try hard to answer. The only way to not have that happen is to not really try hard to learn. That's about the only way to not have very many unanswered questions, is to not be interested in answering questions. A friend of mine used to share this quote with me when we would go to the driving range and hit some golf balls together. Uh, said, practice doesn't make perfect. Only perfect practice makes perfect. A, a quote that uh, came from Vince Lombardi. And that didn't really help me with my slice at the time, but it, it did make a point that standing there and continuing to hit the ball the same way over and over didn't help anything. Just repeating it didn't help if it's not the right thing that you're repeating. Now, I, I came across this quote maybe a little differently, and I couldn't tell who it was attributed to originally, but it starts the same, but it ends differently. Practice doesn't make perfect practice makes permanent. And I think maybe that quote drives the point home a little more strongly. So if I go hit a bucket of 50 balls with my driver and I swing the same way every time and it slices every time, I may have just done myself harm. I, I may have just made my slice more permanent and harder to get rid of. So what I, what I needed to do there this is back to that whole practice and study thing to some extent. What I needed to do is learn why I was slicing, not just keep swinging the club the same way and, and hope it comes out differently, or even trying to swing it different ways but having no idea what might work. Sometimes you need to do some studying or ask someone for some help rather than just keep repeating what isn't working. This is a concept that I, will, I sprinkle into a lot of my lectures because I, I try to make uh, every effort to point out to you what things I consider fundamentals and what things I consider advanced concepts. And here is really the essence of these two things. The fundamentals of just about any skill are things that give you a relatively large benefit for a relatively small effort. And as you move toward advanced concepts, that relationship teeters so that you're getting a relatively small incremental benefit for a relatively large effort. And you could draw, a, it's a continuum, I mean you could draw the farther you move toward advanced concepts, the more effort you have to give to get just a little bit better. So I think a lot of our issues in learning to thermal is we try to learn the advanced ways. And I think a lot of the problem with teaching thermaling is when we try to teach the advanced ways. And, and it's kind of difficult to do if you haven't laid down the foundation. And the advanced ways compared to the very simple ways take a lot more effort and give you very little advantage, very little benefit over just doing it the simpler, easier to learn way, which I think 
is what's more appropriate for the beginner. Now we'll move into a sort of a random smattering of uh, ideas on the, the mental aspects of soaring or soaring psychology, if you will. I like, and I've, I noticed this in soaring years ago, and you could probably apply it to whatever your pastime is, so I don't think it's all unique to soaring, but I like when things I do in recreation are, are good for me in general, just good for me, uh, making me more successful at other areas of life, maybe even a little character building. So here's kind of a random list of some of the things that will help make you a better soaring pilot, but I think will also help you in other areas of life. Patience. If, if you're in soaring very long, you'll find the time when you get stuck in an area and it's all you can do just to barely stay in the air. If you don't have a lot of patience, you'll think to yourself, oh, there has to be something better out there. I'm going to leave this and go find the better stuff. And often enough, that impatience leads to landing pretty soon, where sometimes the patience is rewarded with getting back up and underway and everything's fine again. Not always, but if you have patience, you'll have more uh, success on average. The ability to plan ahead. When you're driving down the highway, uh, do you find yourself having to slam on the brakes a lot? Or do you look half a mile down the road, notice brake lights, and go ahead and back off the gas? Uh, if you're that, the former person who gets caught having to slam on the brakes a lot, you might want to try to change that. I think it could help your soaring to get the mentality of looking at what's ahead and going ahead and being prepared for what's ahead. Ability to keep an even keel emotionally. It does not help when, when you get frustrated, angry, in flight. Uh, it, it does not lead to making better decisions. I can tell you from plenty of first-hand experience, it doesn't. I make my best decisions when I just stay calm, even, and not get upset or too excited or happy. I read a story just today of a guy who made a uh, cross-country flight and ended up landing out in a place where he landed on in a place where he couldn't even get a vehicle with a trailer to it. They had to fly the plane in and fly him out. And a key part of his story was he was flying nice cloud streets and was so giddy about it that he wasn't paying attention and realized that he was flying off the end of the street into an area where conditions were looked much poorer. So he was too excited uh, about how good things were and didn't notice that they weren't so good just ahead. I've done the same thing. So whether you're overloaded emotionally on the good side or the bad side, it leads to worse decision making, which means in the end, worse results. So I try to keep an even keel and do my celebrating or, or my you know, pounding of the ground on the ground later. I think it's important to be able to uh, assess things and make predictions objectively. Not too optimistic, not too pessimistic. I think the best results come in the long run when you aim for pure truth, just, just realism. I want to know how it is and how it's going to be. Not a rosy estimate, not a dark estimate, just how it is. Uh, it's important for anyone who's trying to excel in something to be able to fix their own shortcomings, their own weaknesses. And to be able to fix them, of course, you have to be able to learn about them, to see them. And f to be able to see them, you have the main thing you have to do is want to see them. Uh, I don't think it's all that hard. I mean, it's a little difficult to see our own faults. But 
I believe the real key is to want to. And that's hard because it's tough on our egos to, s to want to see the parts of us that aren't that good. But if you, if you never become aware of them, it's how are you going to fix them and get better? Uh, attentiveness, focus, it, it seems, I don't know if it's a worldwide epidemic these days or what, but we, it seems to be that, that attention deficit problems are, are rampant. And, and that's, it's going to be hard to succeed, hard to process all the things in the air while you're flying. If you can't focus on the things that need to be focused on and let the other things go. Pay attention to the important things and let the other things go. Humility. Soaring will teach you humility if you don't already know it. But if you, if you don't have a good dose of humility to start with, soaring may run you off. And I, I think soaring has a whole lot to offer. It's a great sport, so I hope it doesn't run you off. But be prepared for some humbling experiences. Uh, just a desire to, to be excellent. Uh, that's, I don't think very many people who are excellent just happen to be excellent. I think we do them a, I think we insult a lot of people that are really excellent at things by saying things like, wow, look at his natural talent. I wish I was gifted like that. Comments like this. And sure, maybe, you know, I'm I'm less than six feet tall. I'd probably never make it as a professional basketball player. So there's certain, I was not born with the physique to be excellent at basketball. So there are certain things like that where you can say, yes, it really was a born into to them thing. But I doubt there are very many professional basketball players that are slouches. I think they're really giving it their all. They are really reaching for excellence. So if you want to be excellent, be excellent, you know, go for it. Try. Don't just sit back and say, well, I wish I was naturally gifted like that. <laughs> he may not be as naturally gifted as you want to think he is. He might just outwork you. I think it's important to be able to take a bad situation, and I mentioned before, not don't get too angry or disappointed about it, but not only that, look for how to make the best of it. Every now and then, you get dealt a bad hand. And it does no good at all to just fume about being dealt a bad hand. You still need to take that hand and do the best you can with it. It may not be as good as what you were hoping for. Do what you can with it, and the next hand you're dealt may be better. I call it stink think, and I, and I have to tell myself this. Watch out for the stink think, Eric. Stay away from it. Open to instruction. Uh, it's, that ties back into wanting to see our own shortcomings. We might consider it a shortcoming that we don't already know something as well as someone else. Our ego can get in the way and make it hard to seek out instruction. So the better we can set that aside, the more we'll learn and the better we'll be. But be careful, because then your ego might go up and now you lose openness to instruction. So it's, it's an interesting challenge, but I, I think it is a, a character building type thing. I think the most successful people will credit luck for their success as often as they blame luck for their failures. Because on average, over the long run, luck works out to be neutral. You know, it's not a real thing. It's not a conscious entity out there that cares about us for good or bad. It's pure randomness. It's chance. And if you flip a coin a million times, you're, you're going to come out pretty close to 50% heads, 50% tails. So if, if you find yourself thinking wow, I just really had some bad luck. More often than you think, wow, I just really had some good luck. Then you might need to do a little soul searching here. You, it, an attitude tweak might help you do better. 
Uh, it's important to be able to adapt again calmly when the unexpected ha happens. So when you get dealt that bad hand, you adapt by looking for what can I do with the current situation. It's not the situation I hoped for, planned for, or thought would be the case 10 minutes ago. But now it's the situation I need to adapt, make a new plan. It's important to be able to prioritize what are the most important things. So prioritize and take care of the most important things and a lot of things you may just have to let go. Uh, we have a limited amount of mental bandwidth, I like to call it. There's only so much we can process in flight. So we need to figure out what the most important things are and be sure to take care of those. Otherwise, while we're thinki thinking about unimportant things, we'll neglect the important things and not do so well. Observant. Uh, this one's a challenge for me to constantly be looking for what more can be learned. You know, looking around outside the glider, uh, looking inside the glider through your instruments or your flight computer, what can you learn? On the ground, looking for what can you learn? I m what I mean when you're not flying. And this is sort of a repeat of an earlier point. Uh, eager to listen, not a whole lot to say. You'll, you'll learn more that way. That's the reason for that. It takes self-discipline to do a lot of the things I've mentioned here. And not a gambler. Plays the percentages. Golfers are good at this. You know, going into a, a tournament, that they, I'm told anyway, I never, I was a professional golfer, but that they'll consider, you know, if I played this hole this way, so if from, if from this point in the course, I took this approach, say uh, a long shot over the water versus a layup shot and then a short approach shot. So they'll analyze the two and say, okay, well, if I do the long shot over the water, occasionally I'm going to go in the water. Sometimes I'm going to be in the bunker and, and so forth. Just come up, they'll come up with an average of how many strokes I think it'll take me to get from here to the hole playing this way and do the same thing for the layup shot. On the average, if I did it 100 times, what would my average score be? And playing the percentages just means you go with the one that comes out with the lower average score. Now the layup shot, you might almost never make a birdie. You might make more birdies with the long shot over the water, but you make s more way higher scores so that on average you do worse. So this is what I mean, play the percentages, and in soaring, this type mentality tends to work best. Soaring contests are usually a week long, so this approach tends to lead to winning more contests. Uh, pilots who don't follow this piece of advice, you may recognize that they'll win a day or two in a contest now and then, but they'll have a couple of really bomb out days where they land out, score really poorly, and they don't win contests. So it's not uncommon for there to be a guy on the contest circuit who people are aware this guy wins more days than anyone else or he wins a lot of days but doesn't win many contests and to also be aware of some guys that win a lot of contests without winning a whole lot of days and in any given flight the the same type thinking works out because you for a two or three hour cross-country flight you may need 10 or 15 thermals. So you're having 10 or 15 of these type decisions to make or, or way more because you're passing up a lot of thermals maybe. So if you're, if you're going for the long shot over and over and over, it doesn't take long before your luck catches up with you and you're in trouble or you've landed. I had it said to me some over the years when I was struggling trying to learn, oh, you just need to have more confidence. And I'll tell you, that was very unsatisfying advice. It did nothing for me. 
If a guy doesn't know how to solve a calculus problem, telling him, well, just have more confidence is not going to help him solve the calculus problem. And, and sometimes there's just an idea that we don't have right. And someone saying, oh, just have more confidence doesn't fix that idea. So I like what Charles Darwin said, that ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. Basically, the people who know more aren't as confident. And another guy said uh, something very similar. The greater the artist, the greater the doubt. Perfect confidence is granted to the less talented as a consolation prize. So I think there's a relationship here between confidence and ability. And it's, it's an inverse relationship. So I, if you're less confident, you're, confident, you're going to be more driven to find out how to get better. But if you're more confident already, you're going to think you're already there and not try to get better. So guess who's going to get better? The one who's trying to get better. I believe confidence should equal skill. This is probably a pretty easy question for you to answer. Which is better? More confidence than skill or more skill than confidence? If you have too much confidence, so if you chose answer A, then you're going to fail to see the need for improvement. And you might put yourself in increased risk because you believe you have, have abilities more than what you, you, you believe you have more ability than you actually have. On the other side, if you have too little confidence, you're going to have maybe a little too much focus on improving, but that too much is better than not enough, I believe, and probably less risk because you're not going to put yourself in a situation you don't have the skill to get out of because you think you have a little less skill than you actually do. So you have this built-in safety margin. The downside is you might not perform quite as well today as if you had more confidence. Because if you're leaving yourself this wider safety margin, you're, you're limiting yourself a little bit. I think that it's a, a wise choice to err on the side of too little confidence. If it increases your safety, leads to you getting better, and the only cost is a little bit of performance today, I think that's a good investment. I recently uh, learned of this concept called depressive realism. And it essentially is the idea that a person who sees things the way they really are, which is what I encouraged earlier, is considered generally to be mildly depressed. So on average, you know, is that seeing things as they really are is often coupled with mild depression. Now, I take a little issue with this. I, I, I'm, well, what I mean is I'm not sure this is quite accurate. It, I think it's entirely possible that the average person is uh, looking at the world through slightly rose-tinted glasses. Uh, I believe if you asked everyone on the planet, are you less intelligent than average, more intelligent than average, or average intelligence. I th I'm pretty sure you would get more people answer that they were more intelligent than average than would answer, I'm less intelligent than average. So if that experiment were done and it went the way I think, then I think that would show that on average, People are looking at the world through rose-tinted glasses. So if someone decided to define what is depressed based on that scale, then sure, they're going to say that someone with a realistic view of the world is mildly depressed. I think it might be uh, more accurate to say that the average person in the world is slightly delusional. Uh, but... If you are slightly delusional, you're probably happier. The world looks better to you. You think more highly of yourself. 
than you would otherwise. But you might be less excellent at whatever it is you're trying to be. So, so I don't just mention this for, for random reasons. There is a reason to it. Beware if you really try to look at the world and yourself as it and you really are, then if that's something you're not used to doing, keep your guard out. It, it might be a little bit of a shock to the system. You might feel a little depressed. You might need to ease into it. And here's some pop culture examples of uh, this idea. I'm sure you've heard the saying, ignorance is bliss. Same concept, I believe. Uh, back in, I guess it was around 1990 or so, there was a recurring Saturday Night Live skit daily affirmations with Stuart Smalley. He would always sign off by looking at himself in the mirror and saying, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. You know, he didn't ask anyone these questions. Well, he might have during his uh, skit, but at the end he wasn't asking, wasn't taking a survey, wasn't looking at what the truth really was. He was just saying these things to make himself feel better. And on uh, National Public Radio, Prairie Home Companion, uh, Garrison Keeler signs off with a statement, something like this, you know, and that's the news from Lake Wobegon where so on and so forth, and all the children are above average. So he's making a little bit of a crack about our desire to think we're better than we are. All the children are above average. I, that's, it's meant to be funny, but there's, there's a point behind it. So now let's take a look at some examples of simulation-based training and then get into some of the benefits of it. Uh, simulation is used in flight training a lot these days. Commercial pilots spend a fair amount of time in simulators regularly. So do military pilots. Even uh, submarine Drivers, pilots, I'm not sure what they call themselves. There's one from the, the now defunct space shuttle. Even ships, the Panama Canal, people work there as uh, ship pilots that pilot ships just back and forth through the canal. It's such a technical uh, venture, I suppose and they have a simulator for it. Surgery. With laparoscopic surgery, the surgeon isn't actually seeing with his own eyes what he's working on anyway, so I guess this lends itself to a computer simulation pretty well. Golf. Practice a course you've never played or uh, have your swing analyzed. And Condor. This is my old Condor setup. Condor uh, between the joystick and the software is about a hundred dollars, so you know a lot lower fidelity, but we can still we can still use it to our advantage. I hope that soon we'll see tandem flying in Condor, and I've heard some talking that suggests that maybe it's going to happen this winter, but I've been hearing that said for a few years now too, so. I won't hold my breath, but I really look forward to there being tandem flying in Condor because, as I mentioned before, I think that is the best way to learn thermaling. Get in the glider with someone who already knows how to do it. Uh, it's, it's much more effective than study it on the ground, talk about it, watch videos, whatever, and then go fly by yourself with no one there to see what you're doing and, and correct bad habits before they become habits and steer you toward good habits. In the meantime though, I've uh, borrowed from someone else a solution that works somewhat. It's not great, but it's better than nothing. Using two free programs, Skype and a program called Team Viewer. Let you see the other person's screen and hear the other person's computer. So it's it's 
tandem flying assuming the aircraft only has one set of controls. So one person is the pass purely the passenger and one is the pilot. Simulation has a lot of benefits. There are reasons, good reasons, that it's used so much. It's generally a lower cost way to do something. <coughs> Excuse me. Takes less time because you don't have to do all the overhead things that go into doing something in real life. Like a usual soaring day, you may be gone from home eight, nine hours for a two hour flight because of all the, you know, driving, assembling, disassembling, all this stuff. You, know, you could get that same two hours of practice at home in two hours. You know, maybe 10 or 15 minutes of overhead on top of it, but less time. Safer? I suppose it's possible to get hurt in a simulator, but I haven't heard of it yet. In simulation, you can generally customize the scenario. You can control it and make it what you need it to be for the lesson you want. That's a powerful thing. So not only could you get those same two hours of flying, you could get two hours focused on exactly what it is you're trying to work on instead of just take two hours of whatever nature throws at you today. You can focus on specific skills or tasks. With simulation, because of these some of these other things, you can much more easily work on your skills, build your skills progressively. So start with the simple and move toward the complicated. Start with the easy, move toward the difficult. Reality, uh, you have no control over what you get, and often it tends to give you the most difficult stuff right up front. Uh, with simulation, it's usually pretty easy, generally easier than in real life, to measure and review your performance. Simulators typically record some sort of log of what you just did, so you can go back and look at it again, analyze it, and you don't have, it takes a lot of the guesswork out of things, so you can see how you really did, and not just guess. Your rose-colored glasses are out of the picture, <laughs> because the computer won't lie to you, it won't, it won't sugarcoat it, it'll just tell you the truth. Simulation gives you a lot more freedom to experiment. Uh, you can do things that you might not want to do in real life. Uh, breaking habits is hard. And when you're, in, when you're in the air in real life, often just whatever you're used to is what you end up doing. You don't want to risk getting a worse outcome by trying anything different. It's a lot easier psychologically to do that with a simulator. And you're not limited by the real world, weather, or time of day. You can, you can operate your simulator any day of the year, any time of day, regardless of the weather outside. Here's a quote from one of the guys I worked with. He was, he's a uh, paraglider pilot, and last time I talked to him, uh, still flying as a professional jet pilot, after just a few days of using Condor, he said this, wrote this to me. He said, I think I've learned more about thermals using Condor these last few days than I did in the two $500 thermal clinics I've done the last couple of years. And I'm sure that $500 is just the fee that went to the host of the clinic. Didn't include his air travel or road travel or lodging, probably not even meals. So he probably spent a couple thousand dollars per clinic and learned more with a hundred dollars and just a few hours with Condor. Now part of the reason for this is the typical real-world thermal clinic and this is something that's done fairly often in hang, the hang gliding and paragliding world. I, don't know that I've seen it yet in the sailplane world, but I'm, I'm fairly new to that world. <coughs> Excuse me. So the, the typical uh, 
clinic is you bring your glider with you and it's based at a real world flying site or in a town near it and the intent is to fly. You're hoping it will be in thermal conditions and there will be some classroom instruction maybe early in the mornings or in the evenings. Heaven forbid the weather's not good for flying and you could spend a whole day in the classroom. But the typical clinic is mostly uh, doing real world flying stuff and all the overhead that goes with it. So there's not actually a lot of structured teaching. It's it often largely becomes just sort of an informal hanging out with and being guided by an expert. Having an expert be your sight guide at some place you've never flown. And every now and then you have some time to pick their brain and ask some questions. But I think what he just demonstrated, what he said confirms the ideas I had about these clinics before that that they're more about they, they tend to be more about the flying, just go and fly and have some fun, than they are really about the learning. So that's okay, you know, to each his own, but I, ho I hope that maybe some of the people who give these sorts of clinics, if they think there's an interest from pilots in actually learning more, I hope that maybe they will incorporate some, some simulation in it and have pilots do some thermaling in the classroom. I think they can uh, get a lot more learning done in the same amount of time. Now here's a warning for you if you're a Condor user or any sort of simulator. You won't get hurt in Condor no matter what you do or how many times you crash. And of course a real life crash can kill you. So fly safely even in Condor. They're the point of simulation, one of the main points and, and the big values in it is that it helps you develop more quickly and on your own for less time, all those benefits we mentioned. It helps you develop skills that become automatic more quickly so they serve you better in real life. So the idea is carry with you into real life habits you developed in simulation. And they will, t as they become automatic, that means they're sort of subconscious. You're not really thinking about them. So uh, if what you're practicing in the simulator is good in real life, then that's a good thing. But if what you're practicing in the simulator is bad in real life, then this is a bad thing. So it can go either way. For example, if you get in the habit in Condor of flying really low to the treetops, low and slow, and occasionally you crash into the trees, you, you may find that when you go fly in real life without even thinking about it, you get lower to the trees and slower than you ever have before because you're, that's just what you've trained yourself to do. So be careful. That's a serious warning. Be careful and assume, you know, do things in Condor that you think you need to do in real life. Do your pre-flight, your pre-takeoff checklist, for example. Do your pre-landing checklist. Because if you do these things in Condor, you will be more likely to do them in real life. If you skip them in Condor or exercise poor form in Condor, it's more likely to find its way into real life. So be careful. It's a serious thing you're doing with uh, Condor. Now I'll climb down off that soapbox and talk to you about some of the, the nuts and bolts of how this course works. The basic structure of the course is about a 50-50 mix of lectures like this one, although this one doesn't have as much technical or practical application content as the others. So about 50% these lectures and about 50% hands-on flight exercises. I call them practical exercises. So this is trying to strike that blend between theory and practice. A flight exercise goes 
like this starts with a pre-flight briefing. Some of them are in video form, some of them are in written form, some of them I haven't put in either form yet, so the only option is I'll do it live with you or your coach will. Next, you try the flight exercise. And there's a written procedure handout to walk you through the detailed steps of doing it. And of course, if you need it, uh, some of the uh, exercise materials have a replay file in it so you can watch the exercise being done. If it doesn't and, and you want it, your coach can demonstrate it to you live before you try it. After you think you've passed the exercise, then you would have your course coach grade the exercise. And grading, it's, it's a simple pass-fail thing. There's no score. It's either passed or didn't. And the pass-fail criteria is set. Uh, I try to give a lot of thought to where that's set. And it, it's set at the point where I think if you've demonstrated at least this level of skill here, then you're equipped to move on with the next lesson. So I don't demand perfection, uh, especially in the early exercises. Now, the more you get toward the advanced ones, it becomes more and more demanding of perfection because that's, that's really what being more advanced means. And, and you don't have to do anything with this pass-fail determination. You can go work any exercise you want at any time. They're all on the website for you. Uh, but this is just a recommendation that if you haven't quite passed this one yet, it might be better for you to work on what's keeping you from passing this one than to try to move farther along. You, know, you don't want to be trying to do calculus before you've learned to add, subtract, multiply, and divide, for example. Uh, likewise, you might have passed. Your coach might say, yep, you passed. Go ahead with the next exercise. But you know you didn't quite do it perfectly. So I, I see some of both types of people. Some that want you to say they passed when they really didn't. They just want to move ahead. And some that want to nail it perfectly before they let themselves move on. So I've tried to draw the line where I think it belongs. So if you've passed, it probably means your efforts are going to pay off more to go ahead with the next exercise than to try to perfect this one even more. And then after you have passed, you and your coach will do a post-flight debriefing together. He'll have a few standard notes, comments, questions, uh, related to that particular exercise. Uh, it's, it's a good time for you to mention any challenges you had with the exercise or questions that it led to. And you can do that however you and your coach want to. You could do it live via Skype or through email or a phone call, whatever. And then an informal or extracurricular part of the course is every Tuesday night I host a a Condor online race. So on the website you'll find instructions for joining that mailing list if you want to be uh, invited to those. If I send out a, a, an email the day before telling you the task and the landscape that we'll use and the relative difficulty of the conditions. It's a good way to just have some fun and to there's nothing like competition, nothing like a race to show you whether you're really as good as you think you are. And uh, you may find that you are. You may find that you're better than you think you are. But you may find that you're not quite what you think you are. But either way, it helps you see the truth more. And it might just spur you on to be a little better. That's what I find. It's those who compete get better faster than those who don't. Some of the ideals behind the course, I have sort of hit on this earlier, is I'm a strong believer in the crawl, walk, run approach. So I've tried to make the material follow a natural progression. I've tried to make it clear 
what, uh, in, in what order things ought to be done, you know, what exercises ought to be done before what other exercises, for example. And you may find that some of the exercises have you do things in a way that are not quite like what you'll do eventually. But that's, that's often the nature of learning how to do something new. We learn how to do it in a simple, easy way first, but we won't get quite as good a results as if we could do it a more complicated way. But we'll start with a simple, easy way, and once we've mastered that, we'll move into a little more complicated way that gives a little better result. So don't be surprised if some exercises have you doing things differently than what you think you will ultimately do. I also try to give you what I consider the biggest bang for the buck, things first. Uh, I think it's important that pilots early on are able to stay in the air for long periods of time and, and cover some distance if they want to do cross country. And once they can do that, then they can refine those techniques and get better and better at them. But uh, I like to give you the best experience you can have the soonest possible. I mentioned prerequisites before. I believe prerequisites are, you know, should be respected. That, that, that you'll get the best results if you do the prerequisites first. The course is results focused. So it's it might be entertaining just to learn just to hang out in some of these you know, lectures and talk with other pilots, and that's, that's all good. Uh, flying in our Tuesday night flights, it's a good social event. It, it's fun. But uh, at, the, at the, the bottom line is my goal is to help give you better results, not just to help you pass the time, but to help you have better real-world flights. Here's a sampling of some of the exercises. The first four, not counting one just for people uh, brand new to the simulator, just getting the feel of the stick and rudder, are steady circles. Practice turning steady circles. Very important to thermally well. A couple on 270 adjustments. That's a method for moving your circle a little when it's not quite centered in the lift and then four on an entire thermal centering method, just applied in different types of thermals. There are a couple of exercises on what I call a near-miss thermal search pattern, how to find a thermal that you just sort of nicked the edge of, but not enough to make your vario beep even. It, it will roughly double the number of thermals you find. It did for me, and has for others. Task navigation using a PDA or flight computer or GPS. Rapid climbing, so we're, we're getting to higher numbers, more advanced content. Low save. Uh, that's one of the most difficult things to do. And here are a, here's a sampling of some of the course lectures. Thermaling 101. How to stay in the thermal. Finding near-miss thermals. Finding thermals. Finding and Staying on Lift Lines. Uh, it's a, th a three-part series on advanced thermaling. And if you add all those together, it still doesn't give you as, as much benefit if you already know Thermaling 101. Doing all three of these doesn't improve your flying as much as if you knew nothing and you take Thermaling 101. It's that whole concept of more advanced material uh, takes a lot more effort to get a very small benefit. Cross country basics, there's also one on cross country racing. Team flying. I'll give you some thoughts, some tips on pacing yourself in the exercise. Uh, there is an optimum pacing. You can, you can overload and try to learn too much too fast and it, it it's like imagine the bucket you're filling the bucket too fast and water's just flowing over the sides you're pouring stuff in that doesn't stay even briefly uh, but you also 
can progress too slowly. When you're learning something new, if you don't repeat it often enough, it's hard to uh, make it stick. I believe it's more important to learn things well than to learn them quickly. But, you, you know, it is a balancing act. You have to be careful. You don't need to go uh, a mile deep on, on every idea. I think a good rule of thumb is that about an hour a week of practice is, is a minimum if you're learning something new, whether it's thermaling or playing the piano. If you don't practice it at least an hour a week, it's going to be hard to make much progress. I would recommend that you only work on one exercise at the time. Uh, and this sort of implies that in your first attempt of the exercise, you did not pass it. Because if you did pass it, well, there's no more work to be done on that exercise. So if you tried an exercise but haven't passed it yet, and then you move over and start working on another exercise, when you come back to that first exercise, there's a good chance you've, you've uh, declined. You've, you've lost something and have to sort of start over. And I encourage you to take advantage of the volunteer coaches and, and have them grade your work and essentially, through the pass-fail grade, clear you for the next exercise. Now, you're, you're free to do what you want. And, and all they're going to do is give you a pass-fail, which is essentially a clear or not clear uh, assessment. Uh, you can do what you want, but I think if you take advantage of this, you'll learn a lot, and you get the one-on-one -on -one interaction with a coach. Of course, has a rating system. You know, a lot of us are motivated by uh, accomplishment badges or or ratings. So I gave the course a rating system modeled after the U.S. Hang Gliding and Paragliding Association's five-tiered system. And each rating requires that you pass certain exercises and all of those exercises prerequisites and that you've heard and seen because they all have video with them certain lectures. So you, you move your way up through the system by passing exercises and hearing and viewing lectures. I've made some simplifications in the exercises to help focus your time on learning to thermal and fly cross country. So with very few exceptions, the following are what I've done to make that happen. Uh, one is use only airborne starts, no towing. Now, this is not true on our Tuesday night flights. We do aero tow. But in, in course exercises, you don't have to be able to tow. I, I consider that primary training and thermaling and cross country as more intermediate to advanced training. You'll rarely, if ever, land. So you're not being graded anywhere in the course on your ability to launch or land. Those, those are just outside the scope of the course, that's all. They're important, but outside the scope of the course. You'll only fly one glider in the exercises. It's a standard class Discus II. It has a nice angled glare shield that's a good vis visual reference for bank angle. And it's a simple uh, glider in that it has no flaps. So you won't use flaps in any exercises. Hang gliders, there, there's a design or two that has flaps. Some of the rigid, wing, the rigid wings have flaps, but most hang glider pilots are flying gliders without flaps. And uh, paragliders don't have flaps. You could pull down both toggles, and maybe you could say that's sort of like flaps, but not exactly. And a lot of sailplane pilots fly gliders without flaps, so I just keep that out of things to keep this more general and focus you on the things that are more universal. Uh, we'll never change the glider's center of gravity. We take it as it is. It just simplifies 
things more and never fly with ballast. These are all things that you might do in real life, but that we just don't do in the course to help keep, you, keep it focused on thermaling and flying cross country. If we allowed some of these things to change, designing the course material would be a lot more work also. Say if I said fly any glider you want, then I would have to fly each exercise multiple times in each glider and determine the pass criteria for that glider because it might be a little different. Some gliders can make smaller circles than others, and that would change how quickly you could climb, maybe. So it helps me to design the course more efficiently, too. There's several documents associated with the course, and there's a record keeping system, so we'll talk about that a little. There is a prerequisite tree for practical exercises. So you can look at any practical exercise and s trace its prerequisites back and see. So maybe there's an exercise that catches your eye and you, you think, oh, low save. I want to I wanna try that. What should I do first? And you can trace it back and see all the exercises that I recommend that you pass that will lay the foundation for you to be able to do well in the low save exercise or whatever you're choosing. There's a document, a little one-page document describing the pilot rating system. It, it tells you what exercises and lectures you ha must have passed and heard to get this particular rating. There's another one-page document that's just a sequential list of lectures and exercises you know, mixed in together in what I think is probably the ideal order. So if you don't have any personal preference or, or reason to want to do it in a different order, that's a good plan to follow. And as I mentioned before, each exercise has a written handout. and It's best to just print it out and have it by the computer with you. Step by step exactly how to do the exercise. Uh, it includes the pass requirements at the end so you can grade yourself before you send it to your coach and you should you should know when you send files to a coach you should know whether you passed already and there's an online on the website student record tracking system so after you pass an exercise your coach will go into the system and mark it as passed for you and it'll record it it'll record the date the system will compute whether or not you're your rating advanced and, and will email you, uh, you know, congratulations on passing this exercise and, if appropriate, on advancing to the next level. Same thing for these lectures. I will log after tonight that you got this lecture. Now, the course right now is totally remote learning, so it's web-based. It's like what we're doing now. Um, In-person work is easier. I prefer it face-to-face, -face, look over the shoulder, eyeball to eyeball. That's better, but the travel involved and, and finding the large blocks of time needed to make the travel work, it's just difficult. I, I started out wanting to do it mostly this way, but it was just not working too well. I wasn't getting much turnout. And like I mentioned earlier, there in any given city there aren't that many soaring pilots so this lets me reach the whole world at least everyone who's willing to uh, be up at this hour for a live webinar or as I put these on make YouTube videos of these people can watch them anytime anywhere so visit the course website you'll find all the content I've prepared there there's still more yet to prepare but what I have prepared is there. Uh, I mentioned before pre-flight pre -flight briefing videos are available for some exercises, not all of them. And I've recently started making YouTube videos of these webinars. So a few of these a few lectures are now available in video form. Hopefully more will be in the future. You can use Skype it has free voice and video calling like we're doing right now. 
and screen sharing. You can use that for lectures and discussions, pre-flight briefings and post-flight debriefs. And you can do exercises at home on your, on your own schedule and just send your coach the flight track and replay files as specified in your student handout. It'll tell you what to send. You can send him those files for grading or you too can set up a live session with TeamViewer and Skype and hopefully in the not too distant future fly Condor tandem together. That will be just about ideal once you can do that because the, the TeamViewer and Skype solution right now is a little sketchy. It doesn't always work quite right. Sometimes the audio doesn't come through. Sometimes the frame rate is so poor or the screen resolution is so poor you can't read the Vario well. Uh, once they've done this in Condor, hopefully it should be a lot better solution. So what next? Now that you've, you've been introduced to the course, uh, if you want to go any farther with it, if you want another webinar, another lecture, but don't want to get into the flight exercises yet, then let's schedule one. If, if you haven't watched the video already, I would recommend that you move next into the Thermaling 101 lecture. Thermaling 101, how to stay in a thermal. That's probably the most valuable lecture of the whole course. If you don't have Condor already and you'd like a demo of it, then let me know and you can fly with me in, in one of our weekly online flights. If you want Condor but don't have it, then go get it. Uh, configure it, get a joystick, configure it. You'll find my tips on how to configure Condor and your joystick and which joystick to buy on the website in the getting started section. I make no money off any of that. I just believe Condor is a really good simulator, so that's why I... And the course is built around Condor, so if you want to do the course exercises, Condor is a must. If you already have Condor and a joystick and you're so inclined, then jump into the practical exercises. And if you'd like to have a volunteer, it's all free, the course costs nothing. Uh, if you'd like to have a coach work with you, grade your exercises, debrief with you, so forth, then let me know and I'll be happy to find one that uh, has an opening and get you to connect it. My long-term vision for the course is that it becomes a self-sustaining project, that it, it's, not, it's not the Eric Carden project. It's it's, a, it's its own thing. And, you know, we, whoever we are at the moment, merely participate and contribute to it. Uh, so as, as old coaches and lecturers and administrators, whatever, retire from the course, new ones take their place. So that's the long-term vision I have. Also, I, I hope it can continue to stay free. No cost to the student other than what you have to spend to get uh, your hardware and software. I hope it continues to prove itself to, to be better than the traditional approach, approach alone at teaching pilots all the way from beginner level thermaling through cross-country racing. And it probably will have to evolve as new technology comes along, as we gain more understanding of concepts or learn how to teach more effectively, so forth. So it doesn't need to just sit stagnant. And there are several volunteer opportunities. If you're interested in being part of the course as anything other than a student, uh, the, the biggest need is for coaches to grade exercises for people. Uh, eventually, it might be nice to have some coaches to give lectures, though as I'm producing videos of these, that might be less necessary. Uh, coaches may be needed to give pre-flight briefings for the ones that aren't yet in video form, or maybe some people to help put them in video form. Coaches to do post-flight debriefs. Now that's something that will probably always need to be live because 
I will never be able to fully anticipate every possible misunderstanding or problem or challenge a student might have. So ultimately there is a pretty good benefit in being able to talk live with a coach. And you never know what he might sort out for you that wasn't even thought of when I made that exercise. I didn't even think about that, but wow, it helped flesh out the fill in the blank issue that needed some attention. Uh, could be useful to have someone to volunteer to develop content. I have a list of exercises I'd like to create and just haven't gotten around to. Maybe more lectures. I could use some help with the website. If you've looked at it, you realize I'm no web pro. Uh, maybe I could use some help with the scripting, the language, the code behind the records room, for example. Uh, maybe your, your passion is just spreading the word and, and getting news out, and putting, putting messages out on social media about the course. I have not advertised it very much. Or maybe you just go stir up other people and recruit more people to, to volunteer, whatever. Uh, there may come a time when someone wants to translate it into another language. So for the time being, only people who can read and speak and understand English are able to uh, benefit from this. And here I'm just going to skim through some slides, show you some pictures and a few video clips from some of the course content. Some of these come from exercises and some from lectures. <coughs> 